Hello and welcome to the second video of the poem Among School Children by W.B. Yeats. If you haven't watched the first part, I would suggest that you first please do so and then come and watch this video. The link to the first video is in the description box below. At the end of that video, we had started to read that Yeats is talking about mothers as the metaphor for creators. He's talking about their creation, the children, and he's also talking about the process of creation, which he thinks can be very painful for the mother. And then to what end does she create or to what end does a creator create? And then how is it that the destiny of the created is not in the creator's hand, the child or a work of art or anything that a creator makes charts its own destiny. So indeed, these are questions of origin, of transformation, of the aim of life and also it is in retrospect that Yates is talking about these things because he is among school children and he starts to think about his own life and how today he is 60 years old and how it was for his mother when he was a baby in the mother's lap. So let's discuss the rest of the poem in this video. Let us look at the sixth stanza. Plato thought nature but a spoon that plays upon <clears throat> ghostly paradigm of things. Soldier Aristotle played the toss upon the bottom of a king of kings. World famous golden thigh Pythagoras fingered upon a fiddle stick or strings. What a star sang and careless muses heard. Old clothes upon old sticks to scare a bird. The sixth stanza brings the I would say the most philosophical ideas of the poem in remembering the great philosophers that humankind has known. It is here that indirectly the reader gets this idea that the poet is struggling to answer the question of the riddle of life and he goes to the philosophers, he tries to understand it through them. And then he figures out that they, in whatever context they were, they tried really hard, but even they didn't really clarify or uh, totally conclude or completely, uh, they could not state it completely clearly as to what was the mystery of life, what were the answers to the riddle of life. So he first speaks of Plato and he says, okay, I've read Plato and I haven't found my answers therein. I also did read of Aristotle, but I don't think I had my answers there as well. And then I also read about Pythagoras and we respect them as people who are the leading lights of the thought processes of the human civilization and yet he feels and he doesn't say directly here that uh, I've read them and not found answers but this is the indirect meaning of the stanza that he has tried to understand that who is a creator he talked of the mother in the last stanza why do they create if creation is such a process that engenders pain that engenders struggle and what they create finally has a destiny of its own and therefore the creator cannot really have a complete hold on whatever unfolds in the life of its creation. So why is it that this happens? And these are the answers that he's seeking and he feels that or he says here that Plato thought that nature was this foam upon a ghostly paradigm of things. Ghostly? Something uh, which is which doesn't have uh, absolute total reality paradigm example. And uh, Plato just felt that uh, nature is a sort of a foam that we see upon these things or the set of things that the world is comprised of. The reality of neither of these things, none of these things is ever clear to us. So even he didn't have the answers. Aristotle, uh, he was teacher unto Alexander. So the reference is here to King Alexander. And that is why he says uh, he played the toss upon the bottom of the king of kings. King of kings is Alexander. Aristotle taught him for a while and played the toss. Toss is a musical instrument, but this is to say that he perhaps must have spanked the bottom of the king because he was the teacher. And he says soldier Aristotle, this is to my mind, because Alexander was constantly on a war after another and uh, if Aristotle would have been teaching him then he would be in the company of a king who would always be fighting and the references of soldier Aristotle here. So Aristotle while doing this I could not find my answers even with him and then it is uh, there is an apocryphal story about Pythagoras that he had a golden thigh and golden thigh Pythagoras also <clears throat> he tried to resolve the mystery of uh, 
the universe of the physical space that we are in and uh, he refers to music here the poet refers to music here that Pythagoras fingered upon a fiddle, fiddle stick or strings what a star sang and careless muses heard he tried to figure out why do stars behave the way they do but the muses were careless as in the muses did not shower Pythagoras with the ultimate truth of it all though he did try to play his instruments though he did try to know the truth of the world and he did try to understand what a star sang which is to say what is the behavior of a star Pythagoras might have tried to decipher that but the muses did not bless him they were rather careless and even he did not reach the truth of it all and in the last line he sums up this idea he says old clothes upon old sticks to scare a bird if you remember, he referred to himself as a scarecrow. At that time, we thought in that stanza that he's referring to the fact that he's not physically as attractive anymore as he used to be in his youth. But it is also to say that perhaps we remain scarecrows, stuffed bodies who really have no inkling of what reality is or who have no experience of what actual reality is. We're like scarecrows in a field. We're just there, old clothes and an old stick to scare a bird. Old clothes and old clothes, um, that um, old uh, clothes and old sticks is to say that uh, we all grow old through the journey of life and to scare a bird, that perhaps we have no aim in life. Perhaps this is how meaningless life is because no matter how much we try and look at Pythagoras, look at Aristotle, look at Plato, they really tried hard. But did they reach the end of it all? No, they did not. So what are we born for? Only to scare a bird? So this is a reference to the earlier metaphor that he used. And he says that no matter how intelligent a person is, no matter what his philosophical prowess, perhaps um, the truth of life can never be known and in that sense human beings have a worthless existence there is a sense of pessimism in the stanza when he says that uh, none of these philosophers could decipher it and I have read them and I also feel that I do not know the answers to these questions which occur to my mind in the next stanza that's the seventh stanza he again comes back to the mothers and also to the nuns that he referred to when he had just walked into the school building both nuns and mothers worship images but those the candles light are not as those that animate a mother's reveries but keep a marble or a bronze repose and yet they too break hearts O oh, presences that passion piety or affection knows and that all heavenly glory symbolize O oh, self-born mockers of man's enterprise okay i told you that he's taking the mother as a metaphor of a creator now whenever a creator goes out to create something he or she worships the creation he or she is concerned about the creation worried about the creation and here he compares two sets of people one a mother who's going to give birth and two a nun who's worshiping in my opinion the mother as creator is compared to the nun who's worshiping perhaps in a church to bring to the reader the notion that there is there are various ways of understanding this world one can do it through one's creations or one can do it through a belief in god or in worshiping so i would think that the the comparison with the nun is to bring in this idea that we can also perhaps try to know the truth of this world through worship or through following a religion and following the rituals to get closer to god and god will have all the answers to our questions so he says that uh, nuns and mothers they worship images for the nun it is the bronze or the marble image basically the image of the deity and uh, but a mother has other concerns you know concerns that animate or that uh, that give uh, uh, a sort of uh, movement to a mother's thoughts are the concern for her children so both have different concerns because uh, nuns they pray to statues and mothers they are worried about their children and yet in time these things that they have worshipped whether it's a mother's child or whether it's a, the nuns god they do break hearts so yes creators create there are people who worship gods but in time you realize that these things that you have worshipped they could be your children they could be the god or they could be your creation they break your heart 
You feel that following this path, you're going to reach the truth of this world, but neither creation nor worshipping nor giving birth to a child actually makes you feel that you know it all, that you've resolved it all. And he calls these things or these images or children or creation as presences. They're present. You know, that image is present. Even if the nun is not worshipping perhaps to a physical bronze or marble statue, in her mind also if she has the image of the God that she needs to worship to, that is a presence. And then of course a child is a presence or something that you create. A poem that you write, a sculpture that you make, a painting that you paint, it's present, it's a presence. Now this presence and this presence is known either by passion, the passion that a creator has towards his art, piety or affection which uh, piety, nuns have piety, mothers have piety, mothers have affection. So a creator or a worshipper or a, or a human being who goes on a certain path has a certain kind of passion, affection, dedication for the path and for the creation that is occurring and all that heavenly glory symbolize and in this metaphor you can take everything of the world that you can think of and then comes the last line which is the turning point of this stanza. In this last line he uses a phrase self-born mockers or oh, self-born on mockers of man's enterprise by way of heavenly glory by way of either uh, the God that we believe in or the powers of the nature we end up creating or we end up choosing the path of worship like I said he brings in with the comparison to nuns of mothers and he says that you know, nuns have these presences as gods and deities, mothers have their children and any creator would have his or her creation. These are self-born mockers of man's enterprise. Self-born, they're born out of self. The belief that the nun has in her God is born from herself. The child that the mother bears is born of herself. The creation, be it a painting, be it a sculpture, be it a poem that an artist creates is born of the creator. These are self-born, but they mock man's enterprise. They make fun of the entire spirit of creation. You know, nuns go out with a belief, I'll worship my God and I'll get to the truth of this world. The creator goes out with a belief that I will create this creation and it'll change the world. Perhaps it'll deliver the world upon its pristine reality. But in the course of life, you figure out nothing of the sort happens. And actually our creations make fun of us or make us appear in poor light. Perhaps if the child of a mother does not turn out the way she intends the child's life to be or in some ways uh, uh, goes haywire. In that sense, the child is self-born, but it mocks the mother's enterprise. Why did I go through all this pain of bearing this child who no longer is a source of happiness or a source of respect for me? Or a creator might ask that why did I create this particular poem or write this particular, this particular essay or book or paint this picture if the poem or the picture or the creation does not give him or her the satisfaction, the glory, the peace of mind maybe which they had gone out for so in that sense uh, creation is a necessity everyone does it choosing a path is a necessity a nun has a certain path a creator has a certain path a mother has a certain path but at the same time whatever we create on this path whatever we experience on this path necessarily will not give us whatever we expect from it rather it can turn into a self-born mocker of one's enterprise it was an enterprising spirit with which a creator goes out to create or the fact that a mother goes out to bear a child and she's proud of the fact that she's a mother today but perhaps when 60 years have passed the mother may not be that proud of the child and that is why the poet posits this question in the earlier stanza that would the mother be thinking that what will happen when my child is at 60 years or would she would she be concerned insecure of the the fact that the child would chart its own path. Why did she go through that pain? So the question here is why do we create? If we create to know the truth of this world, well the truth of the world has also evaded great philosophers and if we create, do we create to find happiness for ourselves and why is it that these things have a destiny of their own? Whatever we create is not completely in our hold. Let's look at the last stanza of the poem. He says, labor is blossoming or dancing where body is not bruised to pleasure soul, nor beauty born out of its own despair. 
nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom or the bole? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? He ends the poem with a question. He feels that these are questions that I have posited. I have no answers. But he does believe in one belief which he states very clearly. He says, labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure the soul. When you labor, now this is a reference to the labor pain that the mother goes through and the labor that an artist or a creator goes through to create something or the labor or the effort that a nun or a believer puts into his or her worship to speak to the deity to get closer to God that he or she believes in. So labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure the soul. He says that uh, our work, our effort, our labor can be a lovely blossoming, a lovely dancing an expression of our spirit. If the body is not bruised, if the body doesn't get tired or damaged or ravaged in the process of creating this happiness, so origin should not be a process which should give us pain. Now this is his belief but he states it very clearly. We may agree or disagree with it. He says that beauty cannot be born out of its own despair and blear-eyed wisdom. Blear-eyed when your eyes uh, are very sleepy, they are red, they are tired and you burn the midnight oil which is to say you work through the night to to maybe complete a submission or to write an essay or to work on your exams and then you have this knowledge by way of which you'll go forth but he says no no that should not be the case that you wake up in the morning and your eyes look that you've not rested or that you look at your creation and you know that you've had a pang of birth so you had pangs when this thing was being born or a creator should not look at his creation and feel it's beautiful but then I had to go through a lot of pain and despair to give birth to it. We may agree with Yeats or not agree with him, but this is what he says that um, our work, our labor can be a blossoming or dancing, but we don't have to suffer pain for it. I personally disagree with him here, but this is what he says that uh, it should not be a painful process. And then uh, in the last four lines of the stanza, he changes his tone. He does not describe his belief further, but he does relate to some parts of the belief in the next four lines. He thinks of a tree and a chestnut tree, a mighty chestnut tree. And he asks the tree, are you the leaf, the blossom or the bole? Now, what is a tree? Is a tree that which was a seed once which was that was planted in the ground? Is the tree the first sapling that that seed sprouted into? Is the tree today a part of the tree like a leaf or the bole, which is the part of the tree that grows up from the ground, the trunk? Or it is the blossom, the flower of the tree. What is the tree? Here, in my opinion, he's expressing an idea that we are inseparable from our creations. We are inseparable from who we have been in the past. And that is why I said that the poem deals with origin and transformation because he feels that the tree once was a seed and then it became a sapling and then now it has the leaves, the blossom and the bole. And the tree is everything. It is not that you can separate these two things and say that uh, no the sapling was the tree or the young tree was the tree and this old tree which is matured now and the leaves that it has now is not the tree. No, the entire process of your being is a definition at any given time of the person that you are or of the entity that you are. So he says uh, that uh, I cannot come to this conclusion that what part of the tree is tree and what part of the tree is not tree or what part of the tree's past is tree and not tree because all of its past is tree. And then he says, oh body swayed to music, oh brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? We have to dance and dance is this dance of evolution of the tree becoming from the seed to this full grown tree. It's evolution of maybe a young woman becoming a mother. It's evolution of an artist from a young novice to a very mature painter or sculptor. And this is the dance of evolution that each one goes through. And we cannot separate the process from 
the person. We cannot separate the process from the thing that appears to us right now in the present that we are. How can we know the dancer from the dance? We cannot. So he says that both the process of evolution and the dancer or the mother or the creator or the tree at any given moment are one. The process of evolution is within you at all times. He doesn't answer any of the questions that he raises that uh, why does a mother have to suffer pain and what is she thinking when uh, she gives birth to this child. He doesn't even answer for us the, the question that uh, he poses regarding what nature is and what is the truth of nature when he brings to the poem all the philosophers that he speaks of. Rather in the last stanza he only puts forth a belief that labor is blossoming or dancing, that the dance of evolution should be such that there should be no pain in it. And he believes that it should be a process that we should enjoy perhaps, or we should be, uh, we should have joyous memories of it. And so that we don't have to question that why did I suffer this pang to create this particular artwork or to give birth to my child. He doesn't come to any answers but he raises these questions and very pertinent ones. We all need to think about them. We all need to find our own answers. We all first of all need to find what is that path that we'll choose to create, to dance, to blossom. So that is Among School Children by W.E. Yates. Thank you very much for watching this video. Keep coming to the channel for I'll keep bringing these videos for you. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, do it now. Don't forget to hit the bell icon. If you have anything to say to me, I'd love to hear from you in the comment box below. Thank you very much.